That's right. correct. Sure. Okay. Got to find a way to increase to increase that dilution factor. All right. Welcome everyone to the Town of Brookfield Select Board meeting Thursday, July 11th. Uh, announcements. Uh, actually, before I start, uh, take a moment to pledge the plug. Announcements on the weekend of June 29th, the group of dedicated volunteers guided by Dennis Tucker, our tree warden, planted eight cherry trees along the Route 9 corridor to replace those that died. We wish to acknowledge and thank the following for their time, effort, and expertise. John Holbrook, Michelle Riviere, Chris Lindquist, Russ Snow, Sierra Tucker, and Reese Tucker. Uh, this meeting will be recorded um, by Brookfield we also have some other folks recording. Um, signed warrants. Do you want it? Okay. Sure. All right, item on uh, number one on the agenda um, is a joint meeting with the North Brookfield Select Board and Sewer Commission uh, to talk about possible sewer tie-in uh, to North Brookfield. Uh, the chair from the North Brookfield Select Board had reached out to me about if we'd be interested. Um, this is something that Brookfield has visited before. Uh, last time I believe was back in 2000 and figuring that it's a little over 20 years ago that it was evaluated. I don't know if it was at that time. It lost by a very thin margin, um, but we figured it'd be a good time to talk about it again. <laughs> so I don't know if you guys want to introduce yourselves first. Sure. Our nameplates are here. <laughs> Sure, go ahead. Roger Brooks for the Finance Committee. Uh, Eric Cardenas, Sewer Superintendent. Michael Slazic, Town Administrator. Von Schlegel, Board of Selectmen. Brooke Canada, Board of Selectmen. Um, so unfortunately, Jason, I know, wasn't able to make it. Um, and I had also met up with Eric down to kind of see what you guys have going on and see what the capacity is for us to pump up there, what the options are, what that would look like. Um, I don't really know where to begin this. <laughs> so 
I know we talked about a couple proposed routes to get it from North, you know, I guess pump up to North Brookfield. Um, there'd be a couple different options, but I didn't know if there's anything that you guys had in mind or where you guys kind of stood on it. If you guys want to start first, I guess. <laughs> yeah, well, I think the first thing is we, we need to determine. Uh, Would you mind using a mic? Sure. Oh. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. Uh, I think the first thing is we need to determine if, uh, if and what uh, the interest is from the people of uh, uh, Brookfield. Um, and then once we uh, get an idea of that, and I, I, I believe the next step would be potentially a, a comprehensive wastewater management plan, which, w which would mean uh, Brookfield would probably hire an engineering firm, um, and they would have to, uh, to conduct the CWMP, which would probably consist of several studies, um, such as like a... Uh, They'd have to survey the area to figure out what the collection system would consist of. Um, they'd probably have to do a flow study. Um, they would probably help out with uh, the sewer extension permit that we would have to file with the Mass DEP, um, and probably uh, you know a host of other um, studies to uh, you know to see that this thing goes through. Um, it's it's pretty. This is fairly new to me, I'll be honest with you, but it, I, I do know it's a pretty um, extensive, uh, you know, plan. It's, it, there's a lot that goes into it. Yeah. Um, but, but I do think that would be the first step is to just see what the, what the interest is of, of the people of, of Brookfield. So I guess doing a survey of some sort. Yeah, and one of the other things that I've done in preparation is I have reached out to the state's um, sewer revolving funds to see if an extension is even eligible. I have not heard back from them as of yet, but it was no, it wasn't clearly delineated in the documentation that I read on their website that a sewer extension would be available for that. And the sewer revolving fund would be things such as uh, interest-free loans, grants, things along those lines that they, they kind of combine together to make these types of projects, which are obviously capital intensive. That allows towns, especially small towns, to be able to even consider such an option. So at this point, I think the funding still is a, a question mark as right. far as what's available to us, but I'm, I'm digging in and so I'm also going to look on the federal level too if we won't have anything at the state level. Yeah, but I think back to the question is just getting that survey or getting that interest. I mean, I would think there's definitely going to be some interest if it was a close vote 20 years ago. <laughs> yeah, I think a couple of things we need to take a look at would be, and proximity is going to matter, right? It's just like right now we only have water, you know, north of the river for all intents and purposes. Um, this may actually be outside of the water district depending on where the tie-ins are and the engineering associated with it so i think one of the things we need to take a look at would be and and i don't know if it needs to wait for the formal engineering plan or if we would potentially identify the households that are at least within a reasonable distance for that extension and functionally pulse that zone of town about what their level of interest was yeah. Um, and, and the other thing we need to consider is that sewer would put us in a better position. Uh, we hear it all the time about developing the center of town and having better services and having better, you know, options and businesses and the like. And I think one of the things we need to consider is what type of um, capacity would be there beyond what the max residential expected would be, because we only have so much density right now for residential, you know, it, it would be to understand, and, and maybe we need the engineering in order to do that, but even if we could get a back of the envelope estimate of what would be, you know, what would be the, call it excess capacity available to allow for some amount of center of town expansion based off of, uh, off that sewerage, so. Um, it's especially of interest because um, with the Gabbett property potentially coming up for sale, right? right? You know, it impacts development of that site. It significantly impacts development of that site, and, as well as some of the other sites like the Finney property that's been kind of in the neither hither nor yon right. condition for quite some time. Um, and the fact that we do have some um, 
you know, the center of our town does not have, I know you can perk it, I know that there's better designs now available for septics, but it's a pretty bad re revolving door that people are in in the village area regarding septic systems. Well, and one of the things in the report that I got from Eric that our Board of Health did back in 2000, it mentioned the high water tables in the village district and talking to a, a septic guy recently, he had said it is high water table in this area, which makes it difficult. I don't know what your experience. Well, one of the questions I had for North Brookfield is right now I had a town administrator find out what the average fee was for the user fee per home per business what do you anticipate the cost will go to after you spend 22 or 24 million to redo your sewer system yeah. so to be completely honest with you richard uh it's tough for me to really give a, a number that's where the engineering study would uh would be. no i'm no, specifically you, asking you, about you your community what will the the rebuild of the sewer treatment plant that you're redoing yep. 22 million is it 22 million or 24 million that's about 23 that million 23 million yep. what will the cost of that drive the fees to the average homeowner and right now it's roughly nine hundred dollars per household Correct. annually yeah what will the cost of the new sewer, sewer treatment plant drive those costs to is it just a hundred dollars a year? Do you think it'll be? It will it double the rate? I'm I'm just trying to get some sense where you're going with that. Yeah, I think uh, based off of the numbers that I've seen, I would say I thought it was almost 50 percent more than what they're paying now. So 900 would bring you to an extra 450. Uh, obviously, that, that all depends on the water usage. You know, some people use more yeah. water and their bills are higher. But I I think I think 50 percent uh, increase would be be fairly accurate okay yeah so so i know about 20 years ago at tantasqua we ran a pressurized main down 148 and then shortly after that <coughs> big alum ran sewer all around the lake and i believe the cost to each home was about forty thousand dollars and that was a really densely populated area yeah. the area that we're going to hit is not nearly as densely populated Sure. So my initial concern is if the homeowners are faced with a $40,000 assessment, just the ones in the center of town, and then an annual fee of $1,350, $1,350 a year, I mean, this might be getting beyond where we're at. But, I mean, that's real preliminary. I just wanted to bring those numbers out first yep. and see where we go with it. Yeah. So uh, I think a study would be helpful for us yeah. and we may without spending a dime we may be able it's pretty clear we're going to need several pump stations one on the west end one on the east end if we're going to capture route nine possibly one down on mill street if we're going to capture the south side of this side of the bridge so it's my understanding that each pump station is probably about a million dollars do you have any thought on that i do so uh you know, I think it's important to be transparent with uh, with the people of Brookfield. Again, some of this, a lot of this, is is new to me, so I'm just giving you yeah. stuff I know based off of my knowledge. Um, this is certainly not going to be a. Uh, it's a not. Cheap, it's cheap, not binding. <laughs> yeah, it's not going to be a cheap. Um, uh, you know, build. I guess. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's definitely going to be, I mean, even looking at looking at the study from 24 years ago, they were anticipating almost $20 million to build the collection system to get the sewage to uh, North Brookfield. 20 years ago. That was 20 years ago? About 24 yeah. years ago, yeah, wow. 25 years ago. So, you know, considering potential double in cost, um, you know, that's, I know Ron had mentioned some grants. Um, there's, there's certainly potential for that. Again, I'm, I'm really not the best to give you the advice on that um do you guys have a specific grant writer that's been helping you with those grants yeah, that yeah. our grant writer could coordinate yeah, so and i'm pretty sure the grant writer works for for our engineering firm um i haven't met the guy i don't know him personally yeah guy or gal but um there's somebody that does that behind the scenes that's specifically just what they do for the engineering firm they work solely on the grants um 
I could, I could certainly give you guys some uh, the names and some contact information for the engineering firm that we use. They're the ones who actually conducted this study. Yeah. Um, you may, you know. Well, and what was the name of that? Engine? Well, originally it was SEA Consultants. Yeah. Now it's Kleinfelder. Okay. That's spelled K-L-E-I-N-F-E-L-D-E-R. And also to answer your other question there, Rich, um, according to this study, which was this was this was something that was quite alarming to me, they they anticipated. Now this was this, just so everybody knows, this was not set in stone. This was just like a real, um, real basic study that they did, but they were anticipating up to 17 pump stations. Um, that's that's quite a bit. Uh, that's that would definitely be probably the most for a little community that I'm aware of. Um, and you know, ultimately, that would require at least a minimum of two personnel to operate and maintain that system. And I would say that's probably you know the minimum, you know, potentially three people. Just to gather the small number of homes that we would put on that, you think of, it would be two people, and then then maybe even someone in the billing department as well, probably. Yeah, well, you know, the the anticipated 17 pump stations from the study. Again, that could change. You now, there's there's potential for uh, what they call low-pressure sewer, which is just a grinder pump. Mm -hmm. That could eliminate a lot of pump stations, but that wouldn't that wouldn't be um, known until the, the study was complete. Um, but I, I mean, even if you're talking 10 pump stations, the town of North Brookfield currently has three stations, and when one thing when something goes wrong, it, it requires at least two people. You know, it can be stressful. Um, you know, sewage doesn't stop flowing, so you, you've got to get there, you've got to fix it. Um, so, you know, initially, uh, when it's, when they're built and they're brand new, things function pretty well, but once, you know, yeah. once things, 10, 10 years or so, raw sewage is pretty yeah. corrosive and it's a pretty tough environment and things start to fail pretty quickly and there's a, there's a high operating and uh, maintenance uh, costs associated with keeping up on, on those pump stations. And the other thing that, you know, there's a lot we could really get into, but you look at uh, providing a backup generator for each station. If you don't have a backup generator, you lose power when it's zero degrees out in the middle of the winter. You've got one or two guys out there trying to, uh, you know, hire a pump truck to come out and pump you know, six, seven, eight, nine pump stations. It can be, it can be a lot, you know, so those are all the things that definitely will have to be considered. Um, and again, those are small, they're preliminary, but uh, you know, definitely stuff that's, that's it's, it's important. I think it's, yeah. Mm. Well, and I, I, I know you're saying, you know, is it worth it for the small number of homes? Um, my, my concern is with the number of homes that we do have in the village area, that if those septics start to fail and we can't, f and those residents can't find a suitable solution, those houses will, you know, be useless basically. Sure. I have not seen that happen in 30 years in the septic business. I've installed many septics where we dig out the old one, put the new one right in with technology. We have Elgin septic systems, Presby, they're a smaller footprint. They do a better job cleaning the effluent. I've not seen that happen, but I'm not trying to cancel this thing. I think it's worth investigating. I think it's a long shot, but I, I think it's worth putting more into it. So what would, if Brookfield was the tie-in to your plant, yep. would we be charged about the same rate per gallon as your residents, or have you even considered any rates where that would go? Well, I mean, I thought about it a little bit, and again, that's where an engineering study would come in because, you know, I just, I'd hate to tell you something that was not factual. I would think that the rates would be the same. Um, you know, whether or not there's gonna be a betterment fee, a tie-in fee, um, and stuff like that, that, that's all stuff that would, you know, we'd have to get the engineers involved in. Um, I just don't have a ton of experience with that. You know, that's that's just the honest truth. Um, I don't see why I don't see why the rate would be higher, you know, per gallon. Well, I know the town of Sturbridge sends a lot of their sewage to Southbridge. Okay, they're in the process of changing some of it because 
they're going to put a pump system down by the Southbridge line, from what I understand, and pump it back to Sturbridge, because Southbridge is charging Sturbridge a commercial rate to send it there. So they could actually save money, they figure, if they put in their own pump station and send it to their own facility. Okay. So I, I didn't know if you guys had a commercial rate versus a residential rate. Nope, it's just a, a standard, uh, you know, equal rate across the board. Okay. Um, when it comes to tie-in fees, if you if you if you're looking to tie into the system, there is a di uh, distinction between residential and commercial, a two thousand dollar difference for the tie-in fee. fee to tie yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah, I was aware of that. Yeah. So Perfect. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, the other thing I wanted to point out that I had talked to Jason about that was an area of concern of mine with looking at septic and kind of got my mind going on it is I know he mentioned. Um, areas around the lakes which were in this study you know the concern could be if we ever get mandated which can happen because my mother-in-law's lake house got mandated that they all had septic we'd have to be put into a position to build a wastewater facility here if we didn't tie in which could have an exponential be higher than the tie-in cost i think that opens up a whole nother can of worms the fact that we put something in the center of town wouldn't even be close to several miles around South Pond and Quaybuck Street. I think I think that's a whole nother game changer. But I mean, if the state ever mandated it, we're in trouble. You're absolutely right. So. You're doing your enhancements to your system regardless of what Brookfield does, right? So it really, it's its more what you're looking at right now functionally doesn't impact your plans, correct? Um, I'm sorry, Beth. Can you? So, so whatever Brookfield would decide to do, like if yep. we started a, a, another, a fresh study, yep. got another engineering review done relative to feasibility, that doesn't impact what your plans are currently with regards to your upgrades, yes or no? I would say no. I would say that has no impact. Okay. Yeah. All right. So so you're, you're marching forward. You would be getting the same volume, same upgrades, same everything, regardless of whether we're tying in or not. Correct. With that, whatever you're designing it to being for your own community expansion, your own ability to deal with the volumes and such that you have now and long and longevity for your system. Yeah. Okay. Correct. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Here you go. Go ahead. So can you tell me why you guys changed your sewer treatment plan? Was it because the state had stricter regulations for you to release the yep. your that, flow? Uh, that would be correct, Richard. Um, so every five years municipalities have to basically reapply for a permit. We have a permit that we operate under. On that permit, there's limitation or there's limits for certain parameters that we're allowed to discharge to the river. Um, it seems like every five years, those limits just get stricter and tighter. So the one of the big, the big driving force behind this current upgrade is the total phosphorus limits. They were reduced quite a bit by 50% and the current uh, treatment system could not could not reliably meet those limits. Um, and then also, you know, <clears throat> the treatment plant's almost over 30 years old. Uh, it runs 24 seven. It's a, you know, as I mentioned earlier, it's a very corrosive environment. The equipment's quite beat up. Um, so, you know, the DEP, they, they often come around and tour the plants and they've been pushing for this upgrade for, I'd say about a decade. Um, you know, they've been, they've been, you know, asking the town to, or the, or the previous uh, members of the sewer department to consider the upgrade. Um, you know, this has been this has been ongoing for about four years. From from the initial discussion, they do uh, studies and um, condition assessment and facilities planning, and then they do the, the design. Uh, and then they go to the, to the bidding process, and so it's it's almost a six-year process from start to finish. Um, but yeah, ultimately, Richard, the, the driving force behind the upgrade was. The, the new permit lim limits. You're welcome. I'm going to put them on the spot here, but Jared Grigg, who's actually from Peter Durant's office, uh, 
<laughs> come to join us, and I'm only asking him because I know he's a, on the select board and Spencer, but I mean, do you have any input or anything on, and does Spencer receive from any other towns or no? No, Okay. Right. Uh, not that I'm aware of. No, no, we uh, we had a USDA rural development loan. Yeah. Do you want to join up here yeah. so then they can? <laughs> yeah, that, that's a that's uh, certainly a great question. <laughs> I was hoping to get to that. And I believe you also work with CMRPC, so you you, you got a little bit of. <laughs> All right, green means go. All right. So as far as capacity goes, the plant design is 760,000 gallons per day. Um, currently, our 12-month rolling average is 537,000 gallons. So, uh, you know, I don't want to jump the gun until a study was done, flow assessment. But I do think, looking back at the uh, previous study, they anticipated 100 and, uh, 107,000 additional gallons per day to the treatment plant. That may put us over that 80% threshold, uh, and the DEP could, uh, quite frankly, just uh, deny the uh, the extension. You know, they, based in, off of my experience, what they do is they, you have a design flow. Treatment treatment, treatment plants are are they're built based off of a certain design flow. Um, and then once you reach about 80% of that design flow, they usually look for the look to the town to potentially increase the capacity. Um, the reason they do that, they look at the, the, the design and they figure if you go over that design flow, you could start affecting things like detention time in the plant, and you can start having issues with your permit. I believe that's the reason why they require you to um, to submit plans to increase the capacity. How's now, your I and I? I would say it's high. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I would say it's, it's quite high. Okay. Yeah. That's probably going to be a barrier. Yeah. Um, DEP is pretty big. And what's that? Infiltration and inflow. Inflow. Yeah. Um, basically, like the, the street infrastructure, how much leakage you have within that street infrastructure. Um, and Spencer, it's something we're dealing with right now. Um, so it, it's a pretty big barrier with DEP as far as I'm tracking right now, um, especially with like expanding the existing system and how that would impact that. Yeah, and, you know, so the, the current 12-month rolling average of 537,000 uh, gallons per day is, is actually quite high. I, I'm, I'm confident the reason that we're up that high is because of the uh, – heavy amount of rainfall we've seen over the last year. So the 12-month rolling average, they take the total flow for the 12 months, they add that up, divide it by 12, and then that gives you your, your rolling average. Um, you know, and that's what they look at when they look at the current flows versus what's available. Um, you know, so just doing some quick math, you know, 107,000, that would put us close to, uh, you know, almost yeah, I was gonna say six, six seventy-five somewhere, you know, somewhere in there. Yeah, yeah, right. Yeah. So you know, I don't know that they would hold us to that, but it's it. There's certainly potential. And sometimes what they what they do is, which uh, Roger mentioned earlier, was they'll allow you. They'll say, okay, you know, if you if you're gonna give us twenty-five thousand gallons um, a day, was it a hundred thousand? Yeah, DEP works on a four to one basis, so you have to take out four gallons for every one gallon that you want to add to the system. And, and getting getting back to what uh, was just mentioned before, uh, when you the the INI is difficult because the older construction had clay pipes, clay tile pipes at two or four foot lengths with joint compound, and that's all worn out, so you're getting groundwater. And as Eric was just saying, this past year has been so dramatic. I mean. 
I used to work in Lemonster. If they had a flood, I can tell you the flows are just through the roof. And there's absolutely nothing you as an operator can do about that. So those, those parameters become really stringent from the regulatory standpoint. You know, one thing I wanted to mention is if we just look at the Brookfield Center, um, I think that kind of changes things a little bit from a flow standpoint. Um, you know, um, I think they estimated just from the center or from the the yeah the center of, of Brookfield, uh, 66,000 gallons. Again, those are those are rough estimates. They there's a there's a standard. It's like usually 200 gallons per day per estimated dwelling unit, uh, multiplied by the amount of homes that they considered. We could probably figure that out pretty easy based on the meet, the water usage. We could get real close on Cer that. If we certainly. Got our water department involved. Certainly. There's, there's a factor for I and I that they always include. Um, I'm not sure. I want to say it's like 17 percent, but I uh, don't hold me to that. Okay. Um, but you know that that would have to be included too. Even PVC, fairly new PVC pipe, it just for whatever reason it just it still leaks. You know, I see it all the time in North Brookfield. Um, obviously, the older the older pipes and yeah. older construction is is much more susceptible to right. I and I, but. Um, well, the problem is a lot of it's steep. It's in the water table, and so it's correct. Yeah, even even plastic pipes crack, right? So right. Yeah. So my last two cents is is the town size, the population actually lends to you guys getting grant opportunities, um, in terms of like a positive. Um, Especially with USDA, you guys are already using it. Um, I think the cap's out of ten thousand people, um, population wise. So you have more access to different resources. So smaller communities are better positioned. Oh, yes, 100 percent. Yeah. And it's worth noting, uh, Jared might be able to answer this a little better than I can, but it's my understanding with the new Infrastructure Act, um, when it comes to USDA, that some of these smaller communities can get almost up to 100 uh, percent grant funding. Um, you know, so that's that's something that I've heard recently. Mm -hmm. That would be tremendous uh, for Brookfield if something like that could take place. But yeah, um, no, and I've been on some of the webinars about the grant funding, and that's, I mean, <laughs> if we're going to look at it, now's oh, yeah, the time to yeah. look at it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I don't think that's, the grant funding opportunities are going to get better. They're not going to. Then they're not going to last. It's, it's not. It's not going to go away tomorrow. But it's yeah. something that we would need, given the, the speed at which the wheels of, of local government and funding and such move. Uh, we'd need to start now to probably still be able to take advantage of those USDA opportunities. Any other? I was going to say, I mean, if there really isn't any more comment, so, I, I think. So I, I, I think the biggest thing we need to consider is really the first step would be, because our study is 20 years old, is functionally a new engineer look at what our options are. And I think there's even grant opportunities for just the engineer. So I think that's the first step. We need to look and see what money is out there for us to, to, to take that first step. And then we can give better advice to the community about what makes sense. Mm -hmm. kind of and the technology has changed. There's 17 pump stations. So it is pretty much uphill going to North Brookfield. So that's the one problem. Yeah, yeah. Um, but there may be better technology, better options now. Yeah, so that this study, like I mentioned earlier, doesn't include uh, a low-pressure sewer system, which I think would be advantageous around the um, around the, the uh, ponds here, the lakes in town. Yeah, and that's what they did at my mother, low pressure with grinder pumps. Right, and, and yeah. that's that's essentially almost a pump, uh, pump system itself, you know. Um, so I think that could, there's potential there to eliminate quite a few. I mean, I... I I was looking at it, 17 pump stations, that just seems like a lot, you know, uh, especially, I don't know, I'm not too familiar with Brookfield, I was trying to just, you know, picture it in my head, and it's, it sounds like a lot, it's, it's a small area, you know, but. The problem is, we don't have, like, the steady flow in any one direction, it's every direction. It's like, if you're sitting in the center of the town, like where we are right now, the flow is all four directions. Right. So, Makes and sense, that's right. just capturing a small portion of the town. Right. right. So. 
you know, the other thing too is uh, I think of those potential 17 pump stations, one of them would probably be a quite quite a large pump station in order to get uh, the flow from you know everything that's collected from Brookfield down. I'm assuming Route 9 to the treatment plant. That would have to be quite a large pump uh, to push that many miles. Mm -hmm. So you know that you could potentially be looking at uh, well over a million dollars just for that single pump station. But that's just uh, my two cents, really, not not factual. Realistically, the only way we're going to even move forward with this is with severe grit, like big time grant money. That's I would I agree with that. Going any other way, but I think we should look at that old study before we hire a new engineer to pay for a new study that goes nowhere. Yep. I, I wouldn't be in favor of paying for a new study and then just have it come out to the same as what we did 20 years ago and say, no, we just wasted another 50 grand or whatever it is. I think we should try to resurrect that old study and get some pricing off of that versus throwing more money at it. But I think there's also grants for these studies as well. It could be harder. Oh, okay. I could start looking to see what I All can right. find, but it tends, they like shovel ready projects. Yeah. So. I was going to say, then maybe to, to wrap it up, it sounds like the next steps are, uh, I guess, maybe in parallel. One, we just review the old, to, granted, 24 year old study. Uh, two, we hunt for grants f specifically for a new study, and then we reconvene with whatever we, we find out. And really, not until we have probably satisfied those two objectives can we even start to decide whether or not it makes sense to go even further. And is that survey? part of that because I know there was a survey in that last one that was done but it was very poorly responded to as well <laughs> yeah. yeah that's I, I a think, good question I think it would be worth at least um, probably using the list of folks that are on the water system to begin with plus anybody that's functionally between our water system and wherever the tie-in would be in North Brookfield work with the assessor's office get a list of addresses yeah. and at least get the survey out and see if there's interest both in a paper format and a potentially a link for people to identify and fill out online. Yeah, I don't know if that's something that uh, you know the board or, or employees of the town would could just put something together and maybe save a little bit of money that way. Just send out a, you know something in the uh, in the mail to the residents and see what the interest is. You know, obviously the. First question is going to be, what's it going to cost me? That's, you know, that's always the first And it's a good question. Um, and one thing I just wanted to mention, I don't know if I'm outside of my bounds here, but if we're going down Route 9, there's potential for uh, the residents in East Brookfield to want to tie in, too. Um, so I don't know if we could, you could have, like, a joint discussion with them and say, you know, maybe we can share the cost of, of this study or something along those lines. I know it gets a little tough when you start to play with money that way but have you guys offered this to East Brookfield at any point no. so I I do believe um, this was offered to, to East Brookfield um, this this happened prior to me being superintendent the previous superintendent I believe worked um, you know had some discussion with the Board of Selectmen and some of the members of the community of East Brookfield um, but I, I believe it stopped when they they were, they were basically asking what it was going to cost, give us a rough estimate, and I don't believe uh, the previous superintendent was able to provide those numbers to them, so they basically just shut it down and said, uh, if you can't give us a, a rough cost, we're not going to go any further. But it, there was a lot of discussion about uh, sewering Route 9, where they're doing the work now, and then around Lake Lashaway. Mm -hmm. uh, that's, that's been brought up a few times over the years from my understanding. What would be a better route to go down to East Brookfield and then this way? So, I, I mean, that's what I would think from what I understand of the landscape. Yeah, I here. would think from a t topography standpoint, just shooting down Route 9, it's, you know, it's a little more level, I guess, if you would, in a straight shot. If you try to go 148, you, you, you're battling up and uphill. Right. And, um, you know, so I think that, I think that would be your best bet, but again, you know, a, uh, having a site, um, 
not site, but survey, having the land surveyed by an engineer would be, you know, they, they can you know, answer that better than I can, I suppose. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so what you're talking about is going down Route 9 to about where the bank is and then going up that way? Yeah, I believe, I believe this survey um, was talking going down Route 9 and then taking a left in front of house near the Sitco and then going down that little road there and then back down 67. And you could also pick up, a, uh, I think they estimated 20 homes on 67 up to the, the treatment plant. So there's potential for, uh, you know. Yeah, and the other routing option I had talked to Jason about that I think was discussed at one point was going East Main Street here in Brookfield Main up Main over Main Slab Main. City and then, and then up. Yeah. It's a little bit. Okay, yeah, I, I did see that. Yeah. It's better than 140. It's better than 148, and it also, a lot of East Main's not paved, so you don't have to deal with the disruption of existing roadway, right? Or not a, not a roadway right. that's hard to dig up, let's put it that way. The only problem I see with that is you're traveling a mile with a sewer main and not picking up any users at that point, right? So sure. that drives the cost huge per household. Certainly. Even though it's not paved and it's just a dirt road and it'll, it'll make but the cost of the materials and the per foot cost is still high. So Correct. Yeah. Yeah, I and think that's East Brookfield would be really important to grab as many homes as we could along the way. And, yeah. and really, it would make sense that if they did it, that they would permit around their lake also, because that that's almost the gravity situation on the west side of the lake, I would think. Yeah, I know there was a study done for Lake Lashway. I don't. Um, it's been many years since I've read that. A lot of the times I just go up in the mezzanine and start digging through the files and you can find a lot of neat stuff in there. Um, but but I, I would agree, uh, Richard, you know, Slab City would just be a straight shot with no real connections, nobody helping to pay back. Um, but they might look at it and say it's gonna, you know, the, the could, you could save $4 million by doing it this way and, um, you know, so, that's that's why I keep harping on the study. You know, the engineers can really nail all that right down for you. Yeah, well, I was going to say, I mean, this is also going to be an investment for North Brookfield as well because you're going to be running lines through the rest of your streets that don't currently have it if you're coming down the East Brookfield Road. Yeah, yeah, so the, uh, again, the study did, it did kind of give a cost breakdown um, I don't know if you guys want to go over that real quick or if you just we could if it's something uh, quick. Again, these are you know these are numbers from 25 years ago uh, oh the ones in that report yeah yeah I'm familiar with them yeah okay. did you guys you guys yeah yeah, yeah so I, I would think anywhere where the the sewer pipe runs there's you know there, there's going to be an expectation for people to tie into to pay their fair share of, of uh, that cost. Um, now, I, I saw that you guys have a tie-in fee for new new people coming yep. in. Presuming they don't have a septic line outside, what is that? What? How do you guys assess that to that individual? Do they get an assessment for that? Uh, can you say a question? Again? I guess what I'm saying is, so if you start coming down the East Brookfield Road yep. and somebody wants to tie into that um, and currently right now let's just presume you're not coming do they, what do they have to pay an assessment for you mean like Probably a, a tie-in fee well, if they're not actually if, tying in if they don't if they're in the area yeah. with the sewer getting put yeah. in but they don't yeah. actively tie in what you're talking about is a betterment assessment based on the cost of the project allocated to the property owners along the route that varies based on the cost of the project. That can be, you know, ten, twenty thousand dollars, and you and back to your point, you haven't tied in yet. Mm -hmm. But that's a, that's an assessment against the property because it's a betterment on the property itself, having that access. And then under Title Five, if you had a failed Title Five system, you would tie in. Then it's mandatory. Right. I I, I have seen it before where. Uh, you know, residents are forced to pay betterment fees even if they they choose not to tie in. Um, again, and, and betterment fees is really you know outside of my uh, 
scope of experience, truthfully, th that's all stuff that would have to be negotiated, um, you know, in cost. Uh, you know, I don't think it would be split even across the board if Brookfield was going to uh, assume 450 connections and East Brookfield was only 50. You know, obviously, those numbers would have to be worked out fairly and equally. Um, you know, you, you like betterments and all that. I, you know, I thought about it. Um, I just th that's that's really where the engineers would would they do this every day? They just they give it to you straight. They do all the math for you, break it all down, and you know, really they uh, they do the dirty work for us. You know, there's a lot that goes into it when you consider fees and, and cost and all that. Yeah, and I think functionally. This would be something through Board of Health as they commissioned it last time, right? I could certainly discuss it with Maureen and the Board of Health. Yeah. Um, but I, I think Beth hit the nail on the head. I think what we have to do is determine are there grants or some type of funding source, or we're going we're to be writing a check yeah. for for that and. I guess the, the question I would have is how large of a check would we want to write for a, a, a study or a survey? Yeah, and I know historically speaking, the, the Board of Health has come back to us for help with grant writing and, mm -hmm. and that type of administration. So um, I would just plan on our office sponsoring any grant writing and any pursuit of funds. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've talked to a couple of the members of the Board of Health, and I know they were open to the opportunity. Yeah. Anything else? Anyone else want to add? So I, I do have one question, and that's it feels like not a lot of volume available in your current system. So let's say everything went perfectly. Let's say we go, we get money for a study. Um, I figured I was being loud enough for your mic. That's OK. <laughs> um, you know, we go, we get money for a study. Study comes back, says, hey, even though things are 100% more expensive now, technology's gotten better, and we can actually cover a big chunk of the town for that amount of money, yeah. right? Yeah. But it sounds like we've got a bit of a risk, even if we pursue it, based on the capacity at your plant. But that may be something that's part of the study fundamentally, because with the work that's going on in... Spencer, and from what I understand, the real limiting factor for Brookfield historically, with no disrespect, is that y'all go over your output limits on a fa fair, fair, to, fair to Midland level, right? So it has precluded us pursuing our own capability in town, functionally, because we're downstream of Ewan's, right? And... Um, so would that preclude us from actually being able to put a plant? Put a plant? We can't. We can't discharge. Yeah, we can't. We can't discharge. But but they're upgrading their plant. Right. So so any study we did, we need to make sure that they put all the options back on the table, because quite frankly, we might be better off us in East Brookfield getting together as a lake region if if East is open to it, because then we wouldn't no offense be pumping uphill. Right, because the biggest problem, biggest problem I see with tying in North Brookfield is gravity, right? Sure. It, everything else you can fight, but gravity is 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 one of those laws that that yeah. that there's no court in the land that's going to help us with gravity right now. Correct. So, um, but I still think it's worth doing the study because I think it's a real limiting factor for for Brookfield and ways to expand that still don't necessarily ruin the nature of the town. Right, we could we could have a much more vibrant town center, right? And if we had a better way to address this, you know, having this type of service. So whether it's tying into North Brookfield again, my, my biggest challenge is the numbers. Like the math doesn't make sense to me right now. If our volume would put you over, that seems like a really risky proposition unless 
that part of that proposition was that the upgrades to your plan included like a fairly substantive capacity increase. So I did ask about that actually, now that I think about it. Um, they do own considerable land behind that where they could expand to if they had to. Okay. Yeah. So the 537, the 12 month rolling average that I had mentioned earlier, that number is, that changes monthly. Um, and like I said, this, this is the highest I've ever seen it um, in the seven, eight years I've worked for the town. Um, I mean, just uh, just six months ago, it was like, I wanna say it was like 390. So, so it changes, you know, it, it's been a wet year, I would say, I, I think we had the two wettest July on record. So, you know, that plays a big role in this 12 month rolling average. <clears throat> I do think there's potential for us in our, our engineering firm to discuss with the DEP, and that would all be done during the uh, sewer extension permit application, because this, this has to be approved by the DEP ultimately. Um, I, I do think it, there's uh, potential to talk to them and say, you know, North Brookfield um, embarked on a $23 million upgrade, and you know, there's only a, a thousand users paying paying this back, we have the opportunity to bring on another community, community kind of regionalize um, and, ha and, and allow, you know, or, or Brookfield can help offer some um, financial uh, relief, you know, because they know, I think I'm getting a little too into it with you guys, but they know that 12 month rolling average is a lot of its groundwater. Um, so it's not like the loadings to the plants are, are equivalent to that 537. It's, and they look at it like that too. They look at it from a loading standpoint. Um, you know, so it's something definitely to be mindful of, uh, but I, I'm not, uh, I'm not overly too worried about that. I, I do think, you know, a study would be, um, would be a, a feasible cost effective. Um, yeah, yeah. You know, obviously, if the interest is there, I think that's the biggest thing. I, I can, I can, I think I can speak for uh, the other members of the select board um, in, in the town administrator when I say we certainly have a, a, a large interest in uh, bringing you guys on. Um, so, yeah. so I have a question. So, the additional flow that would we would bring, would you need additional help to run your plant? Yes. I do think so. I mean, just, just from the, the collection system itself, you know. So then, and that wouldn't include the people we would need here to maintain what we would have as well, right? So, so if I'm understanding your question, Richard, uh, so let's just say we, let's just assume we had, we um, anticipated two new operators I think that would cover the collection system and the treatment plant side of things. You know, obviously we would look at the, the fees that were, the sewer fees that were charged to the users would cover uh, On your end, it would cover the, the fees. Yeah. And then lastly, to get a hold of your, the, the groundwater infiltration, are you guys seeking grants or anything to redo any of your old clay lines? Or are you, where are you at that point? And maybe that would, also help to know that there would be adequate room to take on Brookfield. Yeah, so uh, in all honesty, I don't anticipate the town, go and I, and I might be speaking at, uh, out of context here. Um, it's, not, it's not a discussion I've had with any of the uh, Board of Selectmen recently, but I don't anticipate they're gonna wanna go and spend another uh, millions of dollars. I do believe there was a study done about 10 years ago, an I and I study um, f from that the town of North Brookfield conducted, and I believe they estimated 70 million dollars to remove all the I and I. So the engineers basically uh, worked with the town, and they wrote a letter to DEP and said, "There's no plans to remove this. We're just going to if that it would it would take 120 years to pay back. Um, that's to, how do I say this." It, just, it wouldn't be feasible to, to remove it. It's cheaper to, to treat the I and I at, at the treatment plant. It does affect the capacity, but when you start looking at uh, cost to replace 20 miles of sewer pipe, they anticipated. I think it was 70 million. Don't don't quote me on that. But um, so I don't I don't anticipate the town spending any money anytime soon to remove I and I.
Thank well, you. thank you very much for talking with us. You're welcome. <laughs> we'll be in touch. <laughs>
So Ron, I, do you want to take the lead with how to open how we should do this discussion? Is there somebody who's a is there spokesperson for the group? Okay. Do you want to come up? Do you want to come up here? There, there's uh, there two is. spokespeople for the the group that has uh, questions and concerns with regards to the project on uh, Molasses Hill. Uh, at at my request, they have tried to consolidate their questions. The the two individuals that have been identified as spokespeople um, were identified, I guess, at a meeting last week or excuse me, last night, and they will be the primary source of uh, the discussion. There may or may not be questions that arise throughout the discussion process. And uh, I guess the one thing is I, I would ask just to keep everything in a, a, as brief as possible. If there are questions uh, pertinent to the discussion, that we keep the questions as, as short and simple as possible and not start to go off and, and diverge on you know, monologues or something along those lines. So with that, if you could introduce yourselves as the, spo the spokespeople. Yeah, yeah, push yeah, the yeah. button. Perfect. Hi, my name is Elizabeth Olson. I live at 33 Molasses Hill Road. And I'm Steve Carmen. I live at 44 Town Farm Road, and I have property at 57A Molasses Hill Road, getting a house constructed right now, and uh, <laughs> moving into something that's a little bit exciting. So we're here to talk about that. Yeah, um, so I guess I can go first. Um, all of the topics that I want to cover are really focused on the host community agreement as well as um, the nine, I'm not a law person, so I don't know, but the cannabis law, so 935 CMR 500. Um, so the first topic I want to bring up is um, within all three of the host community agreements for Sun Fusion, um, the primary um, name of the company is Sun Fusion Incorporated with a principal office address of 6 Molasses Hill Road in Brookfield, Massachusetts. Um, so the owner of Sun Fusion Incorporated, David Fromm, actually owns two active businesses. One is Sun Fusion Incorporated, which has an address at um, 27 Guinevere Road in North Easton and then another Sun Fusion Cannabis Incorporated that has an address at 6 Molasses Hill Road in Brookfield. Um, both of these companies are actively seeking licensure with the CCC according to the SOC website. Um, and since these HOC, or sorry, the HCAs are a mixture of one business entity's name and one business entity's principal office address, I was wondering are there any steps that need to be taken to clarify what these host community agreements are for which of the two active businesses? Uh, the only thing I know I could comment on, and I, I don't know the answer, but I'm looking into it. I do know maybe there's two different businesses because I know he's doing manufacturing and cultivation, and I'd have to look at the agreements to see if... All three agreements share that same name. Oh, they share the yeah. same name? Yeah, they, yeah. the name of one company and, and the name of another. Yeah. So how yeah. Okay, sounds good. And I did provide this, I'm just reading off of the document I gave you. Um, so this is all in yeah. there as well. Yeah. Um, and there are, there are clips off of. Um, well, thank you for the Thank you. <laughs> and if you need anything else, please let me know. Um, so, all right. Um, sorry, uh, can you hear me better now? Thank you. Um, can you all, can, are you all here? No. No, um, oh, on the back of this, I don't know which one. He's the man. <laughs> uh, is that a little too loud? <laughs> Sounds good. I guess it's so close it feels loud to me. Um, all right, um, and I just wanted to bring forward to um, that the 935 CMR 500 does explicitly state in um, Again, I'm not a law person, so I'm probably going to say this really wrong, but 182 D1, it states that um, all parties shall ensure that the references in the ACA are um, consistent 
with the business entity name certified and recorded by the Secretary of the Commonwealth. So this is a requirement through that um, specific regulation. All right. Um, so then I'm just going to move to the next section. Um, and so this section, just for reference, I don't know if you guys had an opportunity to look at the documentation before. No, unfortunately, I just. Unfortunately, I had just received this tonight, so I'm no. gonna have to go through it. No worries at all. Um, I just wanted to clarify that if you did have a chance to look at it when it was initially reviewed, we did add in this section um, after a resident brought this issue forward. Um, so on May 2nd of 2024, the select board signed the host community agreement for marijuana manufacturing facility at Six Molasses Hill Road. Uh, but the Brookfield zoning bylaws prevent marijuana product manufacturing in rural residential areas. Um, we just wanted to understand um, why the select board chose to sign this HCA that conflicts with the town zoning bylaws and if the zoning board was informed or involved in this process. Um, so this is, I don't know, oh, you have it. Yeah, so it's section two, um, and this is in regards to the May 2nd host community agreement for the manufacturing facility at Six Molasses Hill Road. Uh, the Brookfield zoning bylaws list uh, for rural residential areas, no, for marijuana product manufacturers. Um, so this host community agreement goes against the Brookfield zoning bylaws. So I just wanted to understand um, uh, why you signed this, uh, even though it conflicts with the town zoning bylaws, and if the zoning board was informed or involved in this process. No, that's, that's, it's actually a really good question, although it's not in the packet. No, we, we, we have this packet here. Okay. Oh, we don't have that. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think the, and that's a. So that's the June 2023 zoning yeah. bylaws. Um, and I believe that is the most recent one I checked with. Um, yeah. Well, I think that I think what would happen is planning board just it would impact him getting his permits through yeah. planning board. Yeah. Oh, so he, whether we sign. So so that's yeah. So so understand something. Let, and actually, I just want to level set everybody on the host community agreement. Now, first of all, I agree that that was a miss or an, or or a, um, it was basically fundamentally a miss from a standpoint of um, at no point in the discussion with. Our council was it raised that that the zoning for that property was incompatible because the person and, it, and probably it was a byproduct of the individual that we were working with from KP specializes in the agreements and not necessarily in land use. In, yeah. in land use right so um, however something to understand just in general about the HCA the HCA is fundamentally more of a handshake between the community and the entity to say, yes, you can start the process of going through all the appropriate steps to execute, to, to try to do this type of business in this particular area, okay? Um, I'm not gonna try to excuse the fact that that was a, again, that was a miss, okay, on the part of executing, of reviewing and executing the agreement. Okay. Um, however, it, nothing in the HCA agreement, including, and, and, I'll, and I'll say this, including the, that the HCA itself is in the context of the rules, regulations, and laws of Brookfield as of a particular date, doesn't actually restrict any other board or any other committee from doing their job or doing any type of uh, action that is within the purview of their board going forward, okay? 
J just so that you know, okay? The verbiage that's in there, and, and, and we're, we're getting some visuals from the, from the craft, fundamentally this does not bind the other boards or committees. What it does do is it just establishes that at the point at which it was agreed upon, that was the rules of the road at the time, okay? It, it does also provide some leeway that if something massively were to change, right, from the purview of the other boards, there's some leeway for the Board of Selectmen based on what is right for the needs of the community to pursue or not pursue in partnership and enforcement, whatever those other rules and regulations are put that are put into place. But in order to ensure that we had, it wasn't a moving target, that's why we agreed to the to the date certain when communicating the and media. And I, I just want to confirm that you're um, talking about the, um, I'll have to find it because it was a little bit further down on my, yeah. Yeah, uh, the February 12th date? Yep. February the February 12th. First. First. February 1st yeah. date, okay. So, okay. And, and for instance, like this is a genuine, so the, the manufacturing agreement in a rural residential zone is, is functionally a defect in the HDA, but it also doesn't have any teeth. It doesn't mean that the planning board has to then say, yes, you can use it for that purpose. That's for the planning board when whatever is brought to them comes in, they're gonna say, nope, that's, that's not allowed, right? What so, happens if they don't? I think there are enough people now, enough right. concerned citizens that right. they'll voice and, that, and, but and, what and if they your, don't? And to, your, and to the points that's also presented in the documentation with the abutter notification, the planning board has a, has a legal obligation and it's part of their process to notify the appropriate abutters directly relative to any of the planning board meetings associated with that project, okay? So that's where all of the formal notifications coming from the cogent town board would really kick in is when we're, we're at the point in the process where the individual has at least gotten as far as the licensing which allows them to then go to the planning board or vice versa. I'm, I, I think I'm they have to get their license before they, before they go to the planning even, board. Before they can even go to the planning board. So I think in the, because um, this was one of my questions, was about the timelines in section 13. Um, I'm all over the place on mine now. It'll take me a second to find it. Section nine, um, uh, diligent pursuits of licensure, licenses and approvals. So if these timelines aren't met. Um, uh, I cut off at seven. Oh, you cut off at seven, sorry. Oh no. Um, so basically, it's just we'll, we'll just listen carefully. That's all. So, um, so it's just the section where it says the company shall diligently pursue all licenses, permits, and approvals required to open and operate the establishment within 120 days of the effective date of this agreement. The company shall file with the town planning planning board and zoning board of appeals all application forms required, and then within said 120 days, there's just a bunch of 120 days that go through. So if these aren't met what happens i guess it, that's one it, so question it, in it gives us the option to functionally back out of the hca and okay. that's because under the marijuana licensing laws we can only have a certain number of licenses within the town and there were towns early on in the cannabis industry growing up in massachusetts where people would functionally come to the town get their hca there wasn't any timeline in there and that license was functionally frozen forever, right? Without the ability for the town to say, hey, we've got this next person in line that wants this license. Let's go ahead and issue, be able to, to pull out of this agreement and be able to, to functionally start that entity on their road. Sorry that I'm swinging my arms. No. <laughs> um, in, in order but I think to, I understand. So I mean, yeah. what would happen most likely in that scenario is if after 120 days he's not in front of that planning board, he's probably going to come back in front of this board for an extension or a new agreement. Or a new agreement. And um, yeah. So um, sounds good. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so let me see what section. All right, perfect. And then. 
So Steve's going to talk a little bit about um, more of like the community concerns, things that have been seen um, and observed, the issues that were brought forward to the town administrator, and I'm not sure if we sent it to the select board too. The conflicts of interest with David Fromm and Chris Kelleher, and yeah. then his resignation yeah. immediately afterwards. Yeah. Um, so those are just more general concerns of the actions that have been performed to push these um, facilities forward. Um, so he'll talk about that, but I'm going to keep focusing on the HCA. So I'll try and go a little faster. Um, so I guess we can, I guess this is just a general question for me. Um, so the notices for both select board meetings where HCAs were signed contained minimal information and the HCAs are not located in the primary repository for documentation, my town government, they're not available on the website. So for the March 21st meeting, it just says SunFusion HCA with no um, explanation of what that abbreviation means. Um, so I was just wondering, what are the requirements for notifications to be clear enough to the public to understand? Because to me, if I saw SunFusions here, I think it's a solar panel company because we've got a lot of them. So Yeah, and, and, and uh, actually the board was cited fairly recently uh, with regards to an open meeting uh, law violation for not being more verbose in the agendas. Uh, and frankly, I think at that point, we all said mea culpa, we were guilty as charged. Uh, however, we have implemented uh, some controls to make sure that does not happen again. Um, it, it is now reviewed by several different uh, pairs of eyes, so we can make sure that it is um, in compliance with the open meeting law, both in the letter of the law as well as the spirit of the law. So th that is something that uh, an issue we've had with with other agendas, but we've uh, put pl we've put steps in place to correct it. Sounds good. And is there like specific guidelines available? I'm guessing there must be. Well, yes. In fact, the the rule of thumb is do not use any acronyms, or if you use an acronym. Uh, make sure it's spelled out at least first before it's it's referenced further down in the agenda, and that is something that uh, we we all now have a keen eye for. Sounds good. Yeah, yeah Ron, correct me if I'm wrong. I think it's actually explicitly stated in both the training and the and the verbiage in the open meeting law, correct. relative to to how those agendas are supposed to be. So we're just rather than putting an additional layer of policy or procedure into place, we just kind of reviewed the organic documents coming from the state. Sounds good. Yeah. In, in our defense, HCAs, ARPA, these are acronyms we deal with all the time, and unfortunately it, it kind of sinks into just our normal vernacular, and mm -hmm. we don't even recognize them, if you will, as being something that may be foreign to the average citizen, but we have been made well aware of that. Sounds good. Wonderful. And it would be, would it be possible to get um, the HCA documents put onto that, um, the corresponding March 21st and I believe May 2nd meetings? Um, I, it, we've gotten paper copies, but I really appreciate electronic. Thank you. Yeah, it, and Karen and Ron, that may be something we just want to make as part of the standard practices when the minutes go up, any of the documents reviewed go up. And I have them all, it's just a matter of scanning them on. I've got them all together. Or right here on my notes. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Um, so section four is, I believe, the beginning of when the contract is breached what are the next steps? Um, so section 4A um, starts by looking at the 935 CMR 500 law that says um, no licensed applicant, marijuana establishment, or host community will use inducements to negotiate or execute an HCA. Um, and I guess Steve will go into this a little bit more, but there have been instances where individuals acting in the interest of the company, including the owner of the company, have used undue influence a coercion or strong arm tactics um, to move their personal agenda forward. So um, there is um, another document linked on this. So where it says another document, if you click that, we have another document that really focuses and breaks down 
um, all of those connections that have been found through the public resources. Um, so I won't really dive into that because it's a bit of a to-do. But um, I guess my... Oh, you guys have the old one. Okay. <laughs> no wonder it's all over the place for you guys. I'm sorry. Um, but... Yeah, yeah, if you have uh, the that email link, it'll get you the fresh one. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Sorry, our documents are a little active, so. <laughs> Yeah, here, why don't I just give this, and then you guys can make the full thing, and you'll have, yeah, and we'll all be talking about the same thing. Or is this the one with the other? This is the one, I'm assuming that the yeah. next item email here, I'm assuming that the live link that was forwarded, oh, this is from Karen? So yeah. how is it that small? But this email thing? was the one from Steve. I can also send it right now, if I send it to select board. Would you guys get that right away? Oh, and then she gives it to you. Okay. Is there a period? No. It's just okay. One and done. All right. Yeah, I can send those. I'm so sorry, no wonder you guys have been feeling so lost. <laughs> Is it your full first name, Bradford? Or is it just no, B? B, just okay. B, then last name. Okay. Would you like me to send you it? Sounds good. So in the, it'll say, please find a link to this document here. The here is the link. I should have printed some. I was thinking that. I was like, I should print them some. And I was like, no, they'll have it. <laughs> and I think, you know, I think it was good intent. Yeah. It's tough because, you know, we're working with so many people and concerns get raised and we want to make sure that they get brought forward in this format. So.
only thing I can think to say at this point would be, should we figure out a response back to this? Go through, and it, draft, in go through it in detail and draft a response back? Right. Yeah. yeah. And like what our options are relative to the overreach on the. Oh. Oh, yeah. Sorry. Sorry. So, so, so the the discussion across the table was functionally. Um, at this point, we may need to accept the complaint and the concerns consult with a combination of KP law and some of the other boards and then potentially just respond in writing to the to the issues that were brought forth today because because functionally there's a lot here it's very dense yeah right? sorry no and no that's good okay it, I mean this is this is a good thing and fundamentally um, like we don't necessarily see everything right it's one of the distributed natures of local municipal government the uh, concern raised about the Conservation Commission permit and the, the cutting that exceeded the allowance of the permit, you know, that's something that we need to, to get the experts to look at fundamentally, yeah. right? So um, those, those sort of things. I, I think this is laid out logically enough and with an, enough detail that it gives us the opportunity to really consume it bring it to the to the other subject matter experts I, I really do want to run some of the earlier defects with the HCA back because we we were expecting kind of the a certain level of work product from KP that that clearly there were some misses there um, so and if you need anything um, like for example I don't know if it's linked in this document um, but we did write up a transcript of like the June 12th meeting. So yep. they are required in the HCA and the CCA, CCC regulations to answer all questions relative. One of the specific ones they did not give an answer to was the positive impact statement, which is explicitly required in there. They have like a list of seven things, but that was one of them. Um, so if you need anything like that, like I have transcripts, it's tough with the transcript for the open, that open meeting um, or what that outreach meeting because they did it right before they clear, like they did it right after they clear cut the property. So all of the people came out and were like, what is happening right now? Like you're clear cutting wetlands over here and you have giant logging machines and then half the meeting is spent being like we are not talking about this that's not what this is about so it's kind of sad that we lost so much time because of that for the meeting but there's still a lot of questions they did not answer i'd say the majority of the relevant questions um the answer was i don't know so and i know there's a video out there that I, I was oh at, yes there's I was a video the too meeting, absolutely so. yes 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 but i know sometimes it's hard to watch like an hour yeah. long video right. so sometimes yeah. it's easier and I tried to run it through a program and it was not the best sound quality, so I did have to do a little bit of manual work on it, so it's not perfect, but mm -hmm. I tried my best. <laughs> um, but if you wanna, since this is all like a similar format um, and you wanna review this and move step that, that way, if would you like to still have Steve bring up his points? They're more, um, yeah, I mean, we, I mean, I mean, we can proceed. I, I think the thing that I'd ask is that we we try to keep it a little bit higher level, but, yes. but give us the opportunity if there if we do need to ask some clarifying questions to go ahead and do that. Mm -hmm. And do we have room on the agenda on the 18th? Do we want to revisit any of it? I don't think we'll have a full response ready by then. But do we no, want to? Because that's already next week. Yeah. I don't, I don't know if we'll get one. I mean. I mean, I, I could reach out to. Right. And I, and I wouldn't, I'd also, outside of Nicole, who does the cannabis, I mean, Michelle really needs to know what's yeah. going on here. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think similar to how we handled some of the questions and concerns with regards to Conservation Commission, I think we would have to do the same thing. 
uh, with this regard. So I, I can certainly see uh, Michelle Rendazzo as our primary contact being involved from KP. I could certainly see Nicole being the quote unquote marijuana expert at KP involved. And I would suggest a, a land usage expert from KP to also be involved to address these questions. So I'll be honest, I'm a little nervous about having a, a response or anything of value. We could schedule one the following week if you want. Yeah. All right. I don't know. I don't. <laughs> I don't know my calendar. Otherwise, it's going to be the first of the first week of August. The the twenty fifth. So one of it starts at seven. Yes. By the coming in. Do you have any? Yeah. I mean, and we'll shoot for this if we hear back from council. For, I mean, I'm just, I deal with yeah. a lot of law firms and there's vacations going on, so I don't know. It's the holidays. <laughs> if you'd like, we could put a placeholder on the Yeah, 18th. I'd say put a placeholder yeah. there and let's try Hope it for the best. Even just an update, I feel like. Well, that, that's, yeah. that's, that's more what I was thinking. I yeah. wasn't thinking a full okay. response. I was okay. thinking more updates. Of okay. We, yeah. yeah. I, I mean, what's we, been reviewed, here's where we're at with it. Yeah, I, I'm sure there's going to be some that KP Law will be able to address almost immediately, and there's others they'll probably have to dive into. Because what they might come back is, well, you can do it this way, you can do it this way. And then obviously that makes our job that much more difficult. Steve, did you want to proceed? Yes, I, I would. Okay, so I uh, shared with the board uh, a document at noon today uh, titled Select Board Meeting. 7-Eleven talking point, Steve Carmen. It does outline the sections and the topics that I would like to talk about. I will focus on the items that pertain to questions for the board as well, because there is dense information in here. I sent longer documents as well with cited sources. So I just wanted to pro provide this as an outline that we could navigate. So uh, my first item is David Fromm's unethical business history and uh, a new neighbor and friend provided a good opener here that I would like to read. Uh, marijuana is a controlled substance in Massachusetts. There is a need to assure marijuana establishments are owned and managed by individuals with the essential integrity and business eth ethics and with an untarnished history in business, business ethics. In addition to the select board, the planning board and board of health should conduct due diligence to assure Sun Fusions has this character and pedigree. So it started with the select board and I know your jurisdiction was the host community agreement and you did have several long meetings with uh, Sun Fusions Cannabis, yourself, and also attorneys. But it seems like the steps that would involve the planning board and the board of health did not happen as of yet. I know there's a possibility to have joint meetings as well on issues which may affect a larger community where there are other boards of interest in such a process. I think it would have been valuable to gain input from these other boards when making this decision. I know that you're all volunteer members and it's hard to make time and this was a long lasting conversation but it feels like perhaps getting other boards involved would have gotten more eyes on this and allowed you to do better diligence to review the applicant. So my first item here is that uh, I'm concerned that a proper background check for David Frum, the sole owner of Sun Fusions Cannabis, may not have been conducted. I did note a couple of things on the sheet that do indicate uh, past businesses, which showed a disregard for law and regulation and a exploitation of a vulnerable population, substance abuse addicts for profit. I feel like those two items are incredibly concerning, bringing that into our town without properly vetting the applicant. I can go over those very quickly, what I found and I shared. No, it's pretty comprehensive. Okay. So, so are, would you like me to summarize it or is any, like, I'll, I'll just, I'll just no, say, that, okay. The, the, no, okay. The, I think the public and, and we're on camera, so. Okay. So the two businesses in question, the first one was Safe, uh, safe Haven Sober Houses. 
Uh, this business was started in 2006 by David Fromm and David Perry. They were the two co-owners and managers of this property. They operated an unregulated sober house in Roxbury. It was 11 adjacent townhouses and up to four recovering addict adult men were packed in each room and charged weekly rent. There were problems that are easily discoverable in news reports with the premise. Uh, there were three deaths by over overdose reported on, on the premise. Neighbors reported seeing syringes on site, liquor bottles on the lawn. There were five level three sex offenders, the highest level, and eight level two sex offenders living in the on premises at the same time. Safe Haven Sober House is shut down in 2008. The city of Boston issued zoning and permitting violations against Safe Haven. And after a long legal battle, the city of Boston won. It was a 10 year, I, I linked to the, the lawsuits and the additional documents. So that is the first thing that suggests there is an ethical concern with the, the business history of this individual. The second item, it ties into this was precision testing laboratories. This business started in 2007. It was a drug screening lab in Sturbridge and then later expanded into Selfridge. In a, a news story, uh, it was noted that the State Office of Public Health scrutinized David Fromm's application due to the issues with his sober house operation. Uh, but the Office of Public Health ultimately granted him a license despite this concern. Uh, in that same news story, Fromm claimed that he wanted to open a lab to provide drug screening for safe haven sober houses, additional sober houses, and facilities that treat addiction. And then in, in 2010, uh, well, sorry, let me say it this way. In 2013, Precision Testing Laboratories appeared in a Math Health, Mass Health's audit report. Uh, it was an audit report on drug screening laboratories. The audit stated that Precision Laboratories used, used an uh, illegal billing scheme called uh, unbundling to claim $3.5 million in fraudulent funds over the span of three years. The audit states that labs and sober houses pressured nurses to require their addicts to get tested up to four times per week. Otherwise, uh, the sober house owners would evict their sober house tenants and redirect them to healthcare providers who would approve such extensive testing. So an illegal billing scheme was used and strong arm tactics, according to this uh, report, were used to cause more testing to happen, which means more profit. These tests for an individual test for a drug test by, by state limits were $75 approximately. And by this illegal billing scheme noted in the uh, audit report, they were getting charged upwards of $200 per test. So they're getting more than double the money and also using tactics to get more tests conducted. So that, that audit became known in 2013. Over the span of three years, uh, precision testing laboratories earned $3.5 million in fraudulent claims from the state of Massachusetts only. In 2018, the Massachusetts and Connecticut attorney generals reached a $1 million settlement with precision testing laboratories regarding this Medicaid fraud. Uh, David Fromm was banned from participating in Medicaid programs for 10 years. To, to break it down, this $1 million settlement, Massachusetts claimed $400,000 of that. And from that previous audit, it was $3.5 million of fraudulent claims for the span of three years. So $3.5 million fraudulent activity per that audit with a $400,000 penalty. That seems like a pretty, a pretty easy break. I'd just like to note that these news articles um, include um, journals, or not journals, um, newspapers such as the Boston Globe, um, and I'm trying to think of a couple other ones. They're major news sources, you know. This isn't just some mom and pop shop just trying to sway opinions, their opinions on things. These are prestigious, respected journals in the area. Yeah, on the... Uh concerns with some fusion cannabis document that I shared with you. There's two pages of cited resources at the end of it, and those link to many of the news articles and sources that were referenced. Okay, so that's the end of uh, that first section, but my concern there is what is the process with the select board for 
doing a background check on applicants seeking business in our town. I don't believe. Go ahead. Yeah, I, I don't believe there's any regulation or bylaw indicating a quote unquote proper person standard. Uh, I do know for liquor licenses, there is a proper person standard, whether or not that uh, is also um, required for the marijuana law. Frankly, I'll have to defer to, to KP law and, the, and their experts. But at, uh, at this point, I, I don't think any other businesses rise to that proper person standard other than the liquor licenses. Okay. So for instance, if you are a bad contractor and you moved into Brookfield, you filed a permit, our town clerk isn't gonna verify whether he's done bad business in other towns or not. They're mm -hmm. just gonna issue the permit. Okay. Was your board personally aware of these things that I shared? Yeah. Yes. Did that influence your decision in the process of approving the, the host community agreement? I would say looking at the facts of the situation, I mean, whether it was relevant or not is gonna be I know determined I, by I KP. I know I had seen the sober house issues. Right. I hadn't seen this, the second one that you brought Precision up. testing laboratories? Precision testing laboratories, yeah. Okay, I do have cited resources on there and also the, uh, the mass health audit as well. I just want to make clear that I was not a selectman when this transpired. <laughs> yes, I, I, yes, so yeah, Tom and, Regan. And, 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 and I, I would go back and check because I think with the sober house, because I did follow a trail through, it initially looks like the, the, the initial court cases found in favor of the city of Boston, but I think there was a final one with the Superior Court that actually reversed that. No, it didn't reverse it. This this came out, I believe, the the, the final lawsuit, which I did link to in uh, the concerns yeah, with some infusions cannabis. And look at it, it, it looked like it, it, it functionally reversed the lower court. No, it didn't. So Sun Fusions uh, sued the the city of Boston for discrimination against their tenants because recovering substance addicts can be considered disabled individuals. Uh, the the other thing. Uh, I believe there might have been another reason. I'd have to reference the, the lawsuit itself, but the final the the, the final uh, the the final outcome was in favor of the city of Boston on both counts. Is okay? So there is also associated with that David Fromm's partner, David Perry, I believe. Um, he had a separate case go forward where he was um, exchanging legal counseling for, um, I don't know if I really want to say it, but um, illicit uh, substances and activities from his tenants, and that is separate from David Fromm. So it's important because that one's a lot more scandalous that those are separate issues. That was his partner. Yeah. But this is focusing on the sober house, which he was. Yeah, so I'd rather not go down that yeah. and speculate what connection they still had, even though... Yeah, I'll just leave it at that. Okay, so you've answered my question about background checks and such. It is good to know that you're at least aware of one of those instances. I think it's worth looking into the other because I think instances like that do suggest perhaps there's an ethics issue with the applicant. And one of the aspects of the host community agreement is a good neighbor policy, some expectations of good faith in general when you're coming to any agreement with somebody introducing a business into your town. You would expect them to act in the interest of, a, of your town, ethically, to be honest, to contribute. So that's my first section. Uh, the second section is uh, town government meddling. This is a difficult section because I think there is some different perspectives on this based on the information that was released through what I believe is a misinformation campaign. So I became aware of this situation personally in September 2023. I reached out to the Board of Health because I was having an issue with my construction of my new house on 57A Molasses Hill Road. At that same time, there was an orange uh, phony violation letter sent to residents inciting them to attend a public hearing on noisome trade. Uh, and it misled the, uh, the, the residents on the topic and it caused much, con much confusion in the, the resulting public hearing. So I'm having issues with my, my house construction. I go to the first public hearing meeting 
which is overflowed because there are so many residents who are concerned that their right to farm is being threatened. They're concerned that they can't paint, paint tractors and they can't raise pigs because of what I believe is misinformation in that flyer. So I start looking into it and noisome trade, as was clarified in the follow-up meeting, only applies to commercial businesses. It does not apply to individuals' rights to farm. It does not apply to raising pigs or painting tractors. It is to protect the public from health hazards of commercial businesses. But during this time, so that orange pony flyer was mailed by Christopher Kelleher, who was a Board of Health member at that time. Christopher Kelleher is a long-term tenant and business affiliate of David Fromm's. Dating back to 1999, they have shared addresses in Hull, Massachusetts, in uh, Sturbridge, Massachusetts, in Brookfield, Massachusetts. Uh, they also both had ownership of a company, Glow Stick Factory, at different times. I believe David Frum originally owned it, Christopher Kelleher later owned it. So based on that long-term business connection and residential connection, it seems like there was perhaps a conflict of interest at hand there. In last year, I mentioned that Christopher Kelleher was on the Board of Health. He was also on the Planning Board and also the Conservation Commission. Those are all boards that would have a say in the application approval and permitting and regulations of Sun Fusions cannabis. And I think it's concerning that a member with a conflict of interest would be on boards that have an overlap with the bringing this business into our town. So I can, I can make a quick comment on it, which, which would be, um, I think most people were aware of the relationship. He had signed disclosures with the town clerk um, of the con of the. When you say most people were aware, I did not get that expectation. I did not. I did not have that perception. Okay. Um, Was that known in the town hall space, like individuals who are working? Yeah. And then in regards to Board of Health and Planning Board, uh, those are elected positions, and I don't know if you're aware, but I am aware. we don't have really oversight of him serving on those boards as an elected. I mean, yeah. we functionally can't do right. anything about that. I, I know that the, the appointed position here was the Conservation Commission, right? and it was done in a, a batch. I believe the entire board was kind of signed up at the same time. Yeah, that was that was part of a of a, of a clean sweep where everybody had resigned for various and sundry reasons and and a whole slew of new people were brought on board in order to um, fill the seats and, and keep it running right speaking and I, I understand that boards in our town are a volunteer position and it's those who are willing to to contribute and that election in 2023 running unopposed and also a write-in because nobody was a, nobody ran for the board of health that year. I understand, and that perhaps is an issue with our town that we need to get more government involvement. But for someone with a conflict of interest to come into those boards, and the resulting behavior that occurred, from my observations, is concerning. Can I add a point to that? Sure. I'd just like to point out as well. Um, he served on these boards, refused to recuse himself in agenda items associated with this work. And as we can see now with the Conservation Committee, after he has left it, they have moved forward on actions of the incorrect permit usage, which they did not do prior. So. All right, so I mentioned that I attended a Board of Health meeting September 2023, even up, up to leading in, into the, uh, the noise and trade regulation, I was noticing signs of constant disagreement and uncooperation on behalf of Christopher Kelleher toward the other members of the board. That raised some personal flags for me, compounding that with the, the, the letter that was sent out, the, the phony orange health violation. I'm just trying to get a house built. I'm just there and I see this stuff coming up and then 
the following month when the uh, noise and trade regulation meeting was was held i could not attend i was working out some some other issues i watched the video i've watched lots of meeting videos just to kind of put this all together some i mean the select board meetings and public hearings are often put on the Brook, brookfield uh, uh, community media youtube channel those are readily available but other videos are recorded by private citizens i've watched those as well because sometimes if I wanted to see what's going on with the Board of Health or see what's going on with the Planning Board or Conservation Commission, I could access some of those videos as well. But it was the Board of Health conduct that was most disconcerting to me. And in my opinion, there was a campaign to disempower and sow public distrust in the Board of Health conducted by Christopher Kelleher from inside and outside and also David Fromm. I did outline a few bulleted points where I feel there are signs of this. The first was that a phony orange violation letter that was sent in the mail. I think that was the one that started it. There was lots of misinformation about what this regulation is for, and it riled people up under the expectation or assumption that their rights to enjoy their property, to farm, are being threatened by this, and the Board of Health will not listen to the public. But the point of a public hearing is to hear the public. And the chair of the Board of Health, Maureen Leepak, deliberately hosted a public hearing to get opinion from the public. But I feel in that meeting, many people were invited under false pretense or, or false understanding of what the purpose of that meeting was based on that phony orange uh, health violation letter they received in the mail. The following month, in October 2023, Christopher Kelleher founded the Brookfield Examiner, which was his own personal newspaper. I received it at my residence, a couple issues. I know many other people here have as well. And in those issues, there were articles mischaracterizing and making false accusations about the chair of the Board of Health, saying that things happened in particular meetings. I referenced those videos, and I see no evidence of misconduct that is described in there. It seems like this individual has an ax to grind against the Board of Health, particularly the chair as well. So th that went on until January 2024. I don't believe any issues have, of the Brookfield Examiner have been issued since. But if you have access to those articles, there's still one for January 2024 online. I believe there are three or four articles that are just directly attacking the character of Maureen, Maureen Leepak, chair of the Board of Health, or making some insinuations about what happened during Board of Health meetings that I do not find to be true. So January 2024, Burfield Examiner seems to have gone into hibernation at least. Following month, David Fromm initiates a recall petition, petition to remove Maureen Leepak from the chair of the Board of Health. Another mailing goes out to our, our residents, I receive it, and the information contained therein is more mischaracterizations, misinformation, and statements that were not true. So at that point, it becomes apparent that Christopher Kelleher is against the Board of Health, inside and outside, against the chair in particular. Uh, he seems to also have had, have had issue with the vice chair, Christina Fridella, as well. David Frum initiates the, the recall petition. It fails, does not get the votes required. The following month, March 2024, is when uh, the select board meeting it was March 21st, where you signed the first uh, host community agreement with uh, Sun Fusions Cannabis. And uh, during that same meeting, David Fromm presented a bylaw suggestion for the town warrant. And in his own words, the intention of that bylaw was to eliminate the Board of Health completely within two to three years. To a resident, that seems incredibly concerning that a business owner introducing a uh, a business which has a known potential threat to public health wants to introduce a uh, or wants to propose a bylaw to eliminate the town's board of health and at a municipal municipal level the board of health is the institution to protect individuals from concerns of health threats or issues with the environment surrounding them and to take that recourse away from individuals to bring up issues with nuisances to bring up issues that affect their health. It seemed incredibly alarming to me to hear that said in the same meeting that the first host community agreement is signed 
with Sun Fusions Cannabis. The final point that I have here is, uh, and, uh, and Beth Coughlin, you did, you did address this in, in some detail uh, but while, while Beth was talking about her points. There was one particular section on that March 21st, 2024 meeting that also bothered me. And that was when uh, Sun Fusions Cannabis uh, added the wording uh, to freeze local government regulations to February 1st, 2024. You did clarify what the scope of that is to a certain extent. But during that meeting, David Fromm did make some comments as well, with Kyle Sosa be his lawyer and him there, saying that his intention was to supersede the Board of Health's jurisdiction over Sun Fusions Cannabis. You did have some back and forth with him. Yeah, and, and clarified during that meeting that that it does we don't have purview over what those boards do. That the that the limit of that language is to the agreement between ourselves and Sun Fusion. Mm -hmm. And I think it's, it's language pretty much explicitly to that effect. Yeah. So. So my concern is perhaps what was the additional intention of adding that wording? I know that it might have been, so it's not a moving target that was described there, but I know our town has had difficulty, the Board of Health in particular has had difficulty introducing regulation that would protect residents from commercial business. And it seemed like that again showed a care of uh, an, un un an unethical side of David Fromm, in my opinion that he wants to, in his own ability, uh, supersede the Board of Health's jurisdiction over a business that can be seen as a, a public health threat. So I just wanted to bring community awareness to that because more than anything, this is what raised flags for me. I did not reach out to the rest of the community until June 12th when the first community outreach meeting was, well, the only community outreach meeting was held. And that's when I started talking with other residents here. I met a lot of my new neighbors, residents on the street. It's been a great opportunity to actually meet people, but it's underneath a, I don't wanna say a doomsday scenario, but underneath a very disconcerting background. But I've been watching these meetings. I've been looking into this. I am not somebody who really reaches out, but when I see that there's a whole room of people that are concerned and their questions are not being answered, well, I'm gonna do my part to share what my experience was and what my observations were during that time period. My, uh, my next section is the select board's conduct during the host community agreement meeting. There are two points that I would really like, really like to make here. Many of the residents, even abutters of the property, did not even have baseline awareness that Six Molasses Hill Road was going to be uh, the site of a cannabis cultivation and manufacturing facility. So the host community agreement was signed, the first one was signed March 21st. Following that, almost two months later, June 12, 2024, is when the uh, community outreach meeting occurred. And I think many residents outside of the abutter area the 300 feet that is required for the uh, notification of the uh, the uh, community outreach meeting, I believe. Is that correct? That abutters have to be notified for that for that particular meeting, the community outreach meeting. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Okay. And only at that point did I think the larger audience of our street of our neighborhood residents start getting awareness of this, because a business of this scale affects more than just 300 feet abutters. There are no nuisances and, and health problems, hazards, that a cannabis cultivation and manufacturing facility would pose to residents. Neither Beth or I are within that 300 foot area. And, well, and I understand you recently moved here, but this was a pretty contentious thing at one of our annual town meetings. Actually, two of when our annual town meetings. Two, two, two of the annual town, town meetings when they were and, and think, carving the bylaws to kind of do with What's was it mentioned that Six Molasses Hill was the site no, of that? No, Molasses Hill in general so was not the number an identified address, site. But the, the, the identified was, site of Molasses Hill. The street was Hill. absolutely part, part of the discussion, discussion at both of those annual town meetings, and I think that's I think that's probably where some of the cognitive dissonance on level of community. 
communication is right now is for people that have been intent, like aware and involved in town government. I think there's been a painful amount of awareness of what's been going on and who's who's been involved and what the addresses have been. But for people that typically get up, go to work, probably not in the town of Brookfield, and and go about their business and, and haven't engaged more generally in town government, they probably haven't heard about it because we're also not necessarily a community that gets a lot of attention from like Quaybaugh Current or the Spencer New Leader or what have you. You'll see a lot of stuff about, in spite of our meetings, quite frankly, having enough energy that you would think that they could get a couple of good bylines out of it. We don't tend to wind up on the front page, right? So this meeting might change that, but. Not um, to push any agendas. What's but that? Not to push any agendas, but um, I think that not only with this committee, but other committees as well, and just communications that have been observed between the residents and the town, I think there would be value in um, a sort of communications committee, something where there is a dedicated group of people that work to make sure that the website is up to date, that we figure out how we can get the town and the town's people to know and be better engaged. Be better engaged. I mean, I, yeah, I mean, there's a, I, been a lot I, of opportunity. We've tried a number of And I completely agree with that. It was yeah. part of the reason I got involved with the select board. I feel like the communication is lacking. <laughs> I've, and I've heard Which that is why from I'm working on the website and dealing with some of the communication. <laughs> Sounds good. Yeah. But yes, we need people. Yeah. So, so we, we so might be people I mean, who are interested <laughs> as well. I, I mean, I, I mean, I, I mean, honestly, yeah. Like, it's kind of like when the CONCOM all resigned, I went to some of the few contacts I had in town. And by the way, Chris Keller wasn't one of them. He just wound up in with the Passel. In, in the interest of full disclosure, right? I went to somebody in town and said, can you find me five people that will read a 21 page document and actually try to do their work, right? Okay, but I had pretty much exhausted my contacts in that. So if you have a if you have a group of three to five people interested in being in our communication committee, please bring the names forward. I think so. you'll be seeing them soon. Okay. But um, I guess I do have a question on the the concept of the ComCom really quick. Um, for that's going to be an appointed position by you guys, correct? Yes. Correct. Um, would Christopher Kelleher be eligible for appointed positions still? based on his actions? Not in my opinion. Yeah. No. I think Probably. it would depend. It would depend on what he was applying for. So, so like if he applied I, for ComCom, knowing I, that he no. sends I, false flyers? I, I would say probably not based on performance <laughs> there, but I'm not going to tell him he can't be on the cultural council, right? I'm not going to tell him he can't be on the rec committee, right? If he wanted to go do something to contribute to the community, if okay. he wants to show his math skills and be on the capital improvement planning committee that doesn't exist anymore and he found two friends to be on it to present a report to the town i probably wouldn't say no but sounds good does that make sense yes thank you okay. for the clarification yeah. all right so that march 21st select board meeting I, I watched it in its entirety it's two hours i watched several of these meetings just to build up more context of what was happening. And the conversation that uh, Select Board Tom Regan brought to the, the meeting, he did raise concerns that I think many in our community do share. He had concerns about the residential impact, about water usage, wastewater disposal, odor, uh, and he was also concerned about the local regulations being frozen by the agreement. And uh, Beth Coughlin, there were a couple of comments that you made about the Board of Health during that exchange that I found a little bit uncharacteristic for my, I mean, nice to meet you, I'm Steve. <laughs> but, but I think your, your comments about the Board of Health were perhaps not in collaboration with our, our fellow boards. I did note the, the, some of the comments that I, that and, I did find. And you know what, they're on record, so, uh, and I will own them, and they probably weren't 100% appropriate. There are communications interactions not on any of the public records or documents that you've been reviewing Steve that um, lend itself to my perception of how certain people have conducted themselves in certain positions I will tell you I do not disagree necessarily with 
some of your take on Chris Kelleher's behavior. I will tell you, however, that in my opinion, he's not the only, I don't want to say bad actor, but perhaps inappropriate actor in those relationships. Does okay. that make sense? Yes. Okay. There's a lot of shared culpability in the toxic relationship that existed on our board. Actually. Yes, and I think it's worth acknowledging that. Okay. Because my end point here no, is that- Nobody's innocent. as a goat rodeo, it, it was not solely in the purview of the, of, of the chair, it was all the actors associated with mm -hmm. that particular dynamic on that particular board. Okay. okay. But I, I think those actions did ultimately lead to a further divide in our town, at least for me listening yep. to it. Yep. It, was in a, it was probably language that, that didn't need to be there. And if there are issues with personal issues between board members or boards or whatever it might be, I think our town would be better for it if we could somehow work past that. I know that there are some things that ha happen behind the scenes that are not disclosed. Mm -hmm. And I, I know that you go through this on a regular basis. And all I can do is watch meetings. But from a resident's perspective, it feels like there is a, a divide from comments like that. And I think we need to do better because we can't handle difficult issues such as a host community agreement, and allowing a cannabis facility into our town unless all pertinent boards collaborate in some capacity. It's not necessarily just a, a, a chain of command where, or a, a set of operations where it's select board, planning board, you're done. I think we need the other boards that have authority that are looking out for us residents, looking out for us residents to be involved during those conversations. All right, so that, that's all I would like. Better collaboration between boards because I think that is often at least to a better outcome. You get more hands on it. I know you're all volunteers. You have limited time. But sometimes getting somebody involved who has more, more insight into those issues, getting them involved will lead to a better outcome for the town. My last section is... Uh, why a cannabis facility at this particular location requires town board collaboration and community engagement. And just to be clear, we are going to bring these issues up with uh, the planning board and the board of health as well, because these might be more in their jurisdiction than the select board. But I think for community awareness, it is, it is worth briefly talking about why this is a concern to people in the general area. Six Molasses Hill is one property, it's 166 acres, but there are many people within that general area and it's a rural residential area. Marijuana is a water intensive and nutrient intensive plant. And there are two consequences that come with that. The first is water usage. Everybody south of the Quaybog, as we have talked about earlier today with North Brookfield's participation is on uh, private well water, also private septic. And with a, with a cannabis facility, uh, manufacturing and cultivation facility, water usage can be high. So the proposed cannabis, the cannabis cultivation facility is uh, up to 60,000 square feet. And uh, a, a, a fellow neighbor and resident did some, uh, provided some numbers for me uh, based on research articles that can, uh, that, uh, Growing marijuana requires up to six gallons uh, per plant per day, resulting in an estimated 412,500 gallons of water per acre over the growing season. What, what amount of? 412,500 gallons. No, the, the per plant. Six gallons, six gallons per plant. So I think we specified in the, in the um, agreement that if they were gonna use anything besides a drip system that it would have to, you know, be approved by the town. Drip system does not use that much water well, for there. Okay. If you're talking outdoor, so 100% correct if you're talking outdoor cultivation or if you're talking in-ground cultivation without a drip system, 100% correct. But that's an, for a drip system, you're not gonna hit eight gallons per plant per day. It's not gonna happen. Six. Or six yeah. per, per plant per day. Okay. So I, I just it, wanted to make sure because the, because one of the things I actually brought up during the HCA negotiations, because I know folks south of the river who have 
that during dry season, especially when we had the drought like three or four years ago, there was a lot of people, including um, uh, Nanatampa. Nanatampa, had to sink new wells in order to deal with the lack of water over there. So, right. so that that was actually a, a specific topic, and that's why that requirement of the, of, uh, the drip system, and if it's anything but the drip system, that they have to come back to us is in there. Just so you know, was the the um, amount of water using the drip system was that established? Like how much a drip system would no, use in a day? I, you know, I looked I, I looked it up at the time. I don't think I have the math off the top. That's of my okay. Head, I just but I know it's not six gallons per plant for a drip system. Can I just pause real quick, just because yeah. we're only past the nine? Oh yeah. Uh, so I'll make a motion to uh, uh, continue. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 I meant to keep an eye on the clock. <laughs> okay. Yeah, we're almost we're I'm almost at the end of this. Yes, and and, and, uh, and Beth, I, I did give you you credit for for noting that in that meeting as well in those notes about okay. Nanatomqua in the dry, yeah, the dry area. But I created a map. I'll I'll share it with you as well. Which I got three copies, which indicates all residential addresses within one mile of uh, Six Molasses Hill. Yep. And there are many street addresses in there. They're all south of the Quaybog, of course. So those are all properties on. Private, private wells, private septic. The other side of this is private septic. And I know now that our entire town is private septic more or less, yes, right? Yes, everybody, including the center of the village, everyone. Right, okay. But in this area, so when you're using um, water during cannabis production, the resulting uh, wastewater is considered industrial waste due to its high quantity of pollutants. So it cannot just be dumped into the reservoir in the back of the property it has to be trucked off site. And that would, and in order for that to be done adequately, it, it would require inspections at least, or it would require some oversight. And I think there might be some concerns based on the unethical past business. I, it does give me alarm that the, if things were not followed appropriately or, or there are not, there's not appropriate oversight that this could be a high concern of uh, polluting our, our drinking water in this area of town. I'd also like to note just from personal experience working with hazardous chemicals and materials, it doesn't necessarily have to be malicious. It could just be somebody who didn't realize they weren't supposed to dump it down the drain and have been doing right. it for months, you know, and that's going. And I, I think the only comment I have towards some of this is um, we've dealt with other litigation in, in this town when it comes to businesses operating. and. I'm not saying any of the information you're saying is wrong. I'm just saying that I know in the past when this has gone in front of courts, basically the way the courts address this is until the violation occurs, there's really nothing that can be done. Yeah, and my concern is how will we know that a violation has occurred unless there is proper inspections and oversight well, the and holding them accountable? Well, the Cannabis Control Commission, I believe, I do have a note on the Cannabis con con yeah. uh, Control Commission at the end here. Dysfunctional right now. Yes, yeah, so you can look at news articles. WBUR had posted an article just yesterday that they are undergoing a, a leadership crisis. Uh, they're having lots of problems. Uh, and I don't necessarily think the Cannabis Control Commission is in a good place to regulate the, the activities of already licensed cannabis facilities. I think they are more responsible for the licensing approval process. But once that happens, it does not seem like the Cannabis Control Commission is necessarily engaged in overseeing the businesses, or at least they are not in a position to do so right now. Uh, the, the article that was published yesterday is, saying, is uh, the uh, state lawmakers are uh, considering putting the CCC into receivership because of the extent of dysfunction. Which means that basically the Cannabis Control Commission gets taken away by the state. They have to re rebuild it. I don't have much faith in that, that institution to keep us safe, to keep our groundwater clean. I don't know if that's a problem we're going to be able to resolve here versus the state. Right, but if we were to, say, have some wording in... I know the HTA is said and done, and maybe this is a planning board thing or mm -hmm. what have you, but inspection some ac accountability to ensure that appropriate i think that's that, going to be planning that can get incorporated in as part of the permits <coughs> and that would be the appropriate venue okay so i think one of the things 
and, and it's probably a good place to put it, and, and I'll give you an example. It's kind of like the situation we have with the motocross, where they got grandfathered in, and we have no controls, and the courts haven't helped us, okay, right? I mean, they can hand out trophies, they can, um, you know, say ready, set, go to 20 people all at once, but it's not racing, it's practice. And even though there's more people on that track in a single hour than there was in, in in probably six months back when it was originally a motocross track, they're saying that that's not an, a sufficient change in scope uh, in order for us to consider that a, a, a real racetrack. And so none of the follow-on zoning or regulations applies to it, and we've had no luck in litigating it, mm -hmm. okay? However, there is a permitting process for the marijuana facility through the planning board, including all of the appropriate notifications, right? The, I hate to put it this way, the, the oh, perhaps the only good thing about the situation we're in right now is that you all have done all of your research already and you have now had a dry run regarding all of the concerns so that in communicating with the planning board, right, um, similar to hours of operation, and I don't know the plan. I don't know the planning board law well enough to tell you what they can or cannot put on the permit. Yeah, and we will okay. get on their agenda okay. to discuss this but, with them. But I think now's the time to have those discussions, right, about what needs to be on the permit, um, particularly in light of the the overstep on the conservation permit, right? Mm -hmm. I mean that is troubling. I mean that's that's like let's not set up, let's not step off on the wrong foot. Right. That's just made out of pure stupid mm -hmm. on the part of the company. And so if I'm going to use an appropriate language, I might as well use some more inappropriate language because it's after my bedtime. Okay. So, but functionally speaking, right. Well, you're not on my line. <laughs> okay. I'm, am I loud enough? I'm getting picked up by your mic. Okay. So, <laughs> probably. probably. <laughs> so, uh, so, so functionally speaking, you know, I, I have to concur with not the best start, but we've got, we are only probably the first fur, furlong in a six furlong race right now with this, and we can take advantage of the stumble at the gate to make sure that we get the rest of this correct. Okay. Right? So it's good to have this engagement, it's good to have this feedback from the community, right? We have a lot of opportunity to recover from the stumble up front. We need to take it back to KP got some very uh, well enunciated concerns. Thank you for the organization and the work that's gone in so far. Mm -hmm. um, we're probably, well, we know we're not gonna solve any of it tonight, but at least I think it set the right tone for how we need to take a look at it going forward. Okay. Does that make sense? Absolutely. At least from my perspective, I can't speak for the other two. No, I thought it was well said. Thank you for listening to our concerns. Um, and I think it's important that we were able to bring these forward. So if things change and HCAs need to be rewritten or wh whatever processes move forward, we wanted to make sure that you guys were informed with um, what we have found. So thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I want to check really quickly. Um, because the format was we would have spokespeople, yeah. um, but we would allow if there were questions. Does anybody have any? Oh, you were getting up tired tonight. I'll stay here in the night. Well, okay. Could you come, could you come yeah, we can. Yeah, we'll see. illegal behavior, the contract is voidable. And would you be willing to check with the KP lawyers and see if the contract can be voided? Because we really don't want to see steps two, three, four, five, and six. We would really prefer to have it be done. I spoke with the town administrator today, and we are 
we will have to bring this up as a board but my opinion is to do exactly what you just said so we'll take it up as a board i don't know that now is the proper time because uh, it's not on the agenda that portion but that's my opinion If someone wanted to put like a 60,000 square foot business, why wouldn't something that like that be on like a ballot? Or like why wouldn't the, the residents of the town be able to say whether they want this or not? Um, I understand we have boards. I understand you guys are elected positions. I, you know, you guys have tough jobs. I get that. But like something this magnitude where it affects everybody in the town, why wouldn't the town have a say in that? Why would just the board just say, all right, we're going to go with this or we're not going to go with this? That's my so my suggestion is you and all your neighbors start coming to the annual town meeting because that's where the zoning bylaw changes happen. It has to be a, it doesn't have to be at the annual town meeting, it could be at a special, but when they're changed, it's done by two thirds vote. When a, when a new bylaw is put in place, I don't, I guess that's mostly two thirds vote also. But I, I do want, I do want to say something. But, but I, want to say to the camera and everyone here start coming to the annual town meetings and participate in town uh, I started at a young age I haven't always because I run a business in town but as this thing started blowing up I said I don't care how much business I lose I'm gonna get involved right so we need more involvement from the community so I guess, I guess my next question would be like uh, the transparency of this whole thing, as far as the bylaw changes go, I don't think anybody in the neighborhood really knew about that. Unfortunately, I, there it is posted in the newspaper, probably the Telegram, probably the, but more than likely you wouldn't be looking for it, right? Yeah. If you're not, so, so unfortunately, it met the criteria of the lot, but it doesn't. It's not like you would get a letter to your home. Yeah, you know? although I will say that that the warrant. The, the warrant, warrant the warrant articles that the full warrant yep. for both of the town meetings that we discussed the marijuana bylaw including the verbiage of that bylaw was mailed out to i think every household in the town of brookfield okay so and, and i get it there's other communication modes that are better for different people and unfortunately just like at work Right? Some people you send a Teams message to, some people you send an email to, some people if you don't get them on the phone or you don't crawl by their desk, they're never going to have any idea what's going on. The other thing I'm going to tell you though, and, and, and I work in a highly regulated industry, okay? I work in aerospace, all right? And people tell me every day, oh, we're too regulated, right? And I tell people, well, I work in an industry where as regulated as we are, we ain't regulated enough, okay? Um, but the flip side of it is, is for every person that's in here saying, why don't we get a vote in whether this business comes to our town? I've got 10 people knocking on my door every day saying, how come you can't get more business in this town? Okay. And it's, and it's a real thing, right? It's, and it's even when you look at our master plan, right? We say we want to have a rural and open space. And then the next thing you know, 18 people are like, well, how come we don't have a better tax base? How come my taxes are so high? Get us some more industry, get us some more commercial in town, right? And there's also the concept of, and your point on the zoning piece is, is really important, right? But land use and land ownership and land rights and, and business rights, right? is that if I have the money and if I file the appropriate documentation, and if I'm in an area that allows that work, okay, then it's not really up to the neighbors as to whether or not I can do business there. Because if it was, there's certain businesses that would have no place that they could do business, okay? So your point on the manufacturing, probably the wrong neighborhood, okay? Probably a defective agreement, okay? The agricultural? maybe not do you understand you understand what i'm saying right so so but but if we if we put that litmus test for every business that wanted to come into town we'd get no business in town and and then then people would still be in this room filling it up the same way saying how come there's no business in town how come all the businesses that have left nobody's coming back in okay so so it's a really painful position to try to to figure out where's that line and then there's other times when it gets imposed on us right when we started 
trying to deal with the, the complaints that we got about the racetrack and we went through all of the legal and, and spent everybody's taxes trying to do the right thing, which was just get the same limits on that racetrack that every other racetrack in the state of Massachusetts has that had to go through a permitting process. We were the bad guys. We were evil. We were going after small business. We were just trying to take away clam boxes best customer because that's you know who was doing all their catering right i mean it's like but everybody else in the neighborhood was like how can you let this go on right i'm not excusing it but i'm saying there's, there's this really fine line where if the whole community has to agree to bring in any business you get no business yeah but i, I guess my point is to steve's point is there should have been discussion beforehand about the noisome trade aspect of this facility going in a residential neighborhood. It's house, house, pot farm, house, house. There's somebody that just built a brand new home across the street. I'd be livid if I just spent $300,000 to build a home just to find out that somebody across the street is gonna decimate the land and grow weed there. I mean, I think that the people in the, in the, on the street should have been more aware of what okay. was going on. That's fair. And, and it's, it's noisome trade. It's the odor. I live a mile and a half away, and I'm going to smell it. I can't even imagine the people that are going to be closer that are going to have to live with their windows closed because that's not quality of life. And I think that needs to be taken into account, and the Board of Health should have been involved from the get-go. I'll just make one more point, um, kind of piggyback on what Beth was talking about. It's also a very important, important distinction that the town cannot, I guess, deny a business their rightful, their, their rights to own a business and to operate a, a business, because if it's denied and it's not denied with the proper cause, the town will be open to litigation. And let's be honest, if, if the town has done something incorrectly, and there's a suit that means the town will be writing a very large check so it's very it's very much incumbent upon all the boards involved to make sure they do everything properly right. to safeguard the town but the point is, is that this was a resident this was only as residential rural residential and it was changed specifically for this industry without the town without the residents knowledge. oh no the, so that was an an, that was an annual town that meeting brought forth by the planning board yeah and, actually, and, actually it yeah. wasn't specifically so so there there was a push from this business owner for the chain for the bylaw but we were obligated under the state law to put some appropriate zoning in place because our existing our existing bylaw was functionally an exclusion and left us exposed to litigation that would have opened up every single property regardless of the size of parcel regardless of all of the controls that are actually in the zoning bylaw as written now there are controls and um, limitations put into place that do limit the number of locations functionally where that are eligible within the town of brookfield right and 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 we couldn't especially because as a town we voted over 50 percent in favor of 
the of legalization of cannabis it, it did put us in a position where we had to have a bylaw on the books that functionally allows for the industry to come into town yes ma'am The ethics of the person applying for the job yep. really it should merit. be it has merit. some bearing. And yep. the fact that he started out from the very first permit he got to start this with a driveway along a cart path, that he clearly is it's a not compliant. Right. Yep. So he started off non compliant. What makes you think he's going to comply once his fence is up and everything is back there and nobody can see? Yep. He's not going to cart the wastewater out. He didn't spend enough money on stamps to mail things out. He delivered them around to the houses. He's not going to pay to have the wastewater removed. It'll get dumped. Okay. And I, I think that that's where the focus should be on well, the ethics I, I of think, the Well, I think we're in a different, you understand we are in a different position today than we were when we signed the HCA mm -hmm. by virtue of the behavior relative to the conservation permit, right? Okay. I think, I, I think at the, at the beginning of this process, we're somewhat obligated to presume good intent. Okay, that good intent, there's some material evidence that has already been, it's already been violated that, that needs to serious consideration in how we approach the next steps in the process. Right, so, so it, I, think it, I think it does put us in a very different position than we were necessarily earlier in the process, right? So it's pretty hard to deny when somebody gets a permit and then starts doing something outside the, the limits of the permit. Yeah, and our next recourse, regardless, is planning board. This is a special yep. permit. We will definitely bring our concerns there. Yep, absolutely. And yes, as a rural residential community with <laughs> cannabis facility, house, 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 and so forth, wildlife reservation area nearby, Wolf Swamp, reservoir in the back, Yes, we will bring these concerns up to make sure that they are adequately addressed. And if they are not, we will make sure that the planning board is no, it knows of our concerns. Yep. Um, I was on a planning board for 10 years um, about this when we went through all these new bylaws. Um, I personally voted against everything except the 500 foot um, distance from a school. Uh, as far as this manufacturing, definitely it cannot be in your neighborhood. It's, they can, the, the marijuana can do processing when he harvests his, his crop, but he cannot do marijuana in a residential rural neighborhood. Um, we discussed that very, very much. <clears throat> uh, also, this property is defunct. It's under uh, some realty company that's defunct. So the Board of Selectmen should not have given a permit on a defunct property. Um, that's something that should be uh, readdressed, and I think the whole permit processing by the Selectmen should be done over, because it's done completely wrong. Also, this guy, he goes in, in clear cuts, and he doesn't even get a driveway uh, curb cut from the highway. No one does anything about it. And, the, uh, further, uh, and then he clear cut it. And I'm trying to find the records from the ComCom on when they did an evaluation on wetlands up there. And there's no minutes. I can't find anything. Who, who, who gave him permission to go in and start clear cutting and there's wetlands up there? You've got to have some kind of, it has to be inspected by the board. And the board has to vote. And I want to know where that vote is. I can't find it. Uh, so that's also going on here. So I think, I think the select board and everyone else on the other boards should really look into what's going on here because this is just totally, totally illegal what's going on in our town. And like one lady said, it is going to impact the whole entire town, not just your neighborhood, everybody. And so everybody has got to get diligently here and stay on it. <clears throat> Thank you.
Thank you. Anything else? No. Move on to the next agenda item. Is that it? Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Finished the rest of this water. <laughs> Can I get a? Uh, I'll make a motion. I was gonna say. Oh, I, was gonna say I, was, I was about to say. I'll make a motion to approve the minutes from five two twenty four. So moved. Uh, all in favor? Yes. Aye. And. Uh, Is there any items not reasonably? No. Okay. Motion to adjourn. Second. All Aye. in favor? Aye. Aye. Um,